you all know that the world is warming. It's getting warmer. What you didn't know is that when the world gets warmer, it's going to become more violent, much more violent. And nowhere is this as important as in Africa. Africa is the world's poorest region, no matter how you measure it. It also has the slowest economic growth in the world. Over the past few decades, economic development in Africa has been a roller coaster ride of ups and downs. The 1980s and 90s were particularly bleak. Living standards fell almost everywhere around the continent. But the last 15 years, things have started to change. Economic growth rates are up, incomes are rising, and poverty is falling. With Africa's population poised to overtake both India and China in the coming decades, Africa is also becoming increasingly central to the global economy. But there's a dark cloud hanging over Africa's economic prospects, and that is global climate change. Climate scientists predict that over the next 40 years or so, the world will warm by about two degrees Celsius, maybe more. While that change will be important everywhere, it'll be especially important in Africa. Why is that? African economies rely extensively on agriculture. The majority of the population still works in farming. And African farmers typically don't have irrigation. They rely on rain-fed agriculture. What that means is when the rains fail, their crops fail and their incomes plummet. They become desperate. In those years, government services shrivel up. And all too often, armed militias and opposition groups are emboldened. Will climate change lead to climate conflict in Africa? And if so, will it imperil Africa's recent economic turnaround? While I don't have a crystal ball into the future, I'm going to tell you about evidence that suggests the answer to both of those questions is a resounding yes. Civil war in Africa isn't something unusual or rare, unfortunately. 80% of African countries have suffered from at least one year of civil conflict over the last few decades. You can see that on the map. Once civil wars start, they often last for many years, even decades, wrecking societies. Take the case of Sierra Leone, the beautiful, small West African country that suffered from a brutal civil war from 1991 to 2002. During the war, a million people were displaced from their homes. 50,000 civilians were killed. And during the war, average incomes fell by 40%. Think about that. In our Great Recession, our incomes per capita income fell by a few percent. In Sierra Leone, they fell by 40%. And Sierra Leone, before the war, was already one of the world's poorest countries. The effects were just devastating. I've done field work for my research in a number of African countries over the last 17 years, and nowhere have I seen children as hungry or communities as desperate as in Sierra Leone with the war. Together with my colleagues here at Berkeley, Solomon Shang and Marshall Burke, we sought to try to understand this problem as comprehensively as we could. We gathered studies from every academic discipline, from economics to archaeology, from psychology to political science, all the quantitative data we could get our hands on. We ended up finding 60 studies uh, that use quantitative data to understand this link between extreme climate and violence. Wherever we could, we used the best possible data, what economists call panel data. So this is data uh, that has information on multiple places over multiple points in time, which is really useful in the statistical analysis for understanding relationships. And when we put it all together, we found something striking. Around the world, at different geographic scales, extreme climate leads to more violence. The studies we looked at uh, included psychology laboratory studies, very localized ones, up to data at the city level or the country level. There are even a few studies we looked at that use data globally. And there's actually a fascinating study that found that during the El Nino cycle, when global temperatures are warming, there's a lot more civil war. And when global temperatures are cooling because of El Nino, there's a lot less civil war. 
We also gather data from archaeologists and historians who use tree rings and soil sediment deposits to look deep into the past and get a sense of the long-term evolution of climate and whether those changes relate in any way to political upheaval. And they found that it did. Several major civilizations from Angkor Wat in Cambodia to several Chinese dynasties to the ancient Akkadian Empire in the Middle East all collapsed during especially dry and hot periods periods that look a lot like what the world may look like in the next 40 years. The case of the Maya civilization in Mexico is especially uh, remarkable. Here in this figure, the high, higher up on the, on the graph denotes a wetter climate, uh, which archaeologists have uh, collected data on. Lower values mean it was drier, and you can see a few of those spikes downward. Those are very dry periods. So during the 9th century AD, there were three long droughts that hit the Maya civilization. And what's remarkable is the periods of those droughts line up almost exactly with three periods of internal civil war that historians have documented. At the end of the 9th century, the classic Maya civilization collapsed. At the other end of the scale, we looked at psychology studies, very localized studies. Psychologists have actually found a remarkably similar relationship. At higher temperatures, people are more aggressive. One example of this is an experiment in the Netherlands where psychologists took two groups of Dutch policemen and put them in two different rooms. One room was very hot, one room was cool, and they made them go through a computer simulation exercise. The policemen in the hot room were much more likely to shoot at a potential intruder on the screen than the policemen in the cool room. Seems like retaliation and escalation uh, increases with high temperature. There's another fun real-world example right here in the U.S. Baseball. All of you guys know that sometimes when a pitcher uh, throws the ball, he hits a batter. Well, what is the other team supposed to do? Sometimes in baseball, the pitcher on the other team retaliates by hitting a batter on the other team. Researchers have studied this and found they're much more likely to retaliate when it's hot in the ballpark that day. You can actually see the statistical relationship here on the horizontal axis is stadium temperature relative to average temperature in that ballpark. And on the uh, vertical axis is the likelihood of retaliation. There's a very strong statistical relationship. In terms of interpreting this figure, on the shaded area of the graph, the darker areas are where most of the data lies, right there in the middle. Let's go back to Africa. It's more important than baseball in the United States here. Uh, the map on the left is the map of Meatu District in Tanzania. It's a poor rural district where I've worked. It's kind of unbelievable in this day and age, but in Meatu District today, there are still hundreds of murders of women, old women, accused of being witches. It's unbelievably tragic. It turns out there are many more of these murders in hot and dry years. That's what the figure on the right means. Moving beyond witch killing, other researchers have looked at a broad definition of violence across nine East African countries. You can see all those blue squares. Those are all the different data points that they look at. And they have a very comprehensive definition of violence from uh, civil conflict to food riots, even cattle raids. It's a very comprehensive data set. And once again, when temperature gets warmer than normal, there's more violence. And the relationship here is very strong. Every one degree Celsius, so about two degree Fahrenheit increase in average annual temperatures, increases violence across all these categories by about 20%. Moving beyond the village and the region, other studies have examined these relationships at the country level. You can see the blue figure, the blue panel of the figure. When it's warmer in African countries, that figure tells us that civil wars are more likely to break out. And then the green figure, all the way on the right, that was the study I told you about before, during the warming periods of the El Nino global climate cycle, there's more civil conflict. At all different scales, this relationship holds. These are just four studies. We looked at dozens of studies. And in all, there were 27 modern studies that had the kind of panel data that we like and that's reliable that focus on temperature. Out of those 27 studies, which were from all over the world, some were on urban crime in the US, others were on uh, riots in India, others were on violence in Australia, 
27 out of 27 studies, as temperatures increased, there was more violence. That is a relationship that's very unlikely to hold by chance. If you were to flip a coin 27 times, you'd get heads 27 out of 27 times. It's, it's less than one in a million odds. So this is a very robust relationship. The bottom line is, when it gets hotter, there's more violence in human populations. What does this mean for the future? We can take these findings and combine them with what we know from climate science to figure out implications for Africa. This map here shows how much warmer it's going to get relative to current patterns by 2050, so just the next few decades. You can see a lot of the dark shaded regions are in West Africa, Central Africa, or in the Horn of Africa. There's also some dark shaded regions in other parts of the world. Taking this information together with our findings across these dozens of studies, we predict that violence will increase in Africa to 2050 by about 40 percent, a 40 percent increase in violence. This is just staggering. Remember, 80 percent of African countries have already had civil conflict in the last few decades. There's a lot of political violence in Africa, but it's going to go up a lot more. So what should we do? What's the next step? In many ways, the research on climate conflicts is where the research on smoking was 50 years ago. Scientists 50 years ago figured out smoking caused lung cancer. But figuring that out didn't tell them how to fight lung cancer or get them to have people quit smoking. There was a lot more work that was done and is still being done to solve those problems. The same is true for climate conflicts. A worldwide research effort is already underway getting started to try to solve these problems. How can we do that? Some scientists are developing new crops that are resistant to extreme climate. Others are trying to figure out how we can introduce insurance schemes, maybe weather insurance schemes, to help African farmers adapt to climate change. But the truth is, we don't know the answer. We're trying to find the solutions. Here at Berkeley, my colleagues at the Center for Effective Global Action are using randomized controlled field trials and other data analysis approaches to make progress on these issues. Of course, the best solution would be not to have global warming in the first place. The best solution would be to reduce emissions enough, carbon emissions, so the world doesn't warm by two or three or four degrees Celsius in the next few decades. There's something deeply ironic about the fact that Africa will suffer so much from climate change. Climate change is not Africa's fault. Climate change is the fault of the industrialized countries, rich countries like the US, European countries, China, that are spewing out CO2 emissions. But Africa is going to pay the price, and that is just deeply, deeply unfair. Thank you very much.